Support for Trifles comes from the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And by listeners like you, who choose to support us on Patreon for as little as $1 a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the thumb was engineered, the foot was deviled, and the Peter was black, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder what a basket chair is? Or why Watson's medicine of choice is always brandy? Or what a coal scuttle is and why cigars would be there? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 350, Terrible Human Tragedies. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the podcast about the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, uh, you are not terrible. Uh, you are human. Mm. <laughs> you're you're occasionally a tragedy. <laughs> You sound, it's mostly you sound, a comedy with you. you. You sound questioning about that. <laughs> oh, t- tragic. Oh, I thought we were talking about magic. Oh, oh magedies. Terrible yeah. human magedies, yeah. Uh, well, you know, we have an apology to make. In the last episode, we talked about suicides in the Sherlock Holmes stories. And we've heard from a lot of listeners who complimented us on the... Uh, dexterity with which we handled it, the care and the um, well, uh, careful consideration of suicide. Uh, and I'm here to assure everyone that's purely accidental on our part. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in doing so, we left out one of the most widely recognized stories related to suicide in the Sherlock Holmes canon, and that is The Veiled Lodger. And it was uh, by no means uh, something we did on purpose. We had it in our notes, but it it ended up being a jam-packed show. So we overlooked it. And so uh, here in our 350th episode. Good grief. 350. Did you get me flowers or anything, Bert? I mean, (laughs) what's what's the typical uh, anniversary gift for 350? I think you get a laser-engraved coffin. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I could use one of those about now. <laughs> yeah, I think you get. It has to. It must be something to do with interment. That's, oh, well, uh, that, what a great way to celebrate then! One of the most <laughs> tragic cases in the Sherlock Holmes stories. But, uh, but here, here's the thing: the, the the question we have, and it is something that Chris Redmond asked years ago in uh, Redmond's Delicate Questions. Uh, He he, uh, correctly saw that uh, Watson called this one of the most terrible human tragedies, but is it really the most tragic story in the Sherlock Holmes canon? That's what we're going to explore here today. Hmm. So, uh, in order to get ready for that, I just wanted to make sure you are up to date on your reading. This is The Veiled Lodger, uh, episode uh, 350. You can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash trifles350. Any related things to uh, today's episode can be found there, including the ability to support us on Patreon. And just go to patreon.com slash trifles if you'd like to go directly to our Patreon home. Uh, and there we have ad-free versions of the episodes. And we also have some outtakes for you. Uh, we are compiling a number of uh, flubs and uh, other additional content from the show that you might want to listen to. So that's a great way to ensure you get more of trifles by becoming a Patreon supporter for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, we do appreciate our recent patrons and uh, what you have added to our show. And we hope to continue to add to the community. 
Well, it's never easy to talk about tragedy, but uh, as long as Arthur Conan Doyle has set it down in writing for us, it's at least a little easier for us to put our arms around. Um, and this this is, I, I guess we overlooked it because it, it is one of the final stories in the entire canon. I think it is third from last, if I'm not mistaken, mm. uh, in the case book. And it's a very different kind of uh of, of Sherlock Holmes story because there's really no action. It's all told uh, as a flashback. Uh, but what other observations do you have just at a macro level, Bert, about The Veiled Lodger? Well, it's it's never been a favorite case of mine for a variety of reasons, and one of them I think you allude to. that, And Watson alludes to it, too. You know, it's it's... It's it's a it's a very odd case. It's, it's just unusual in a couple of ways. One is that it has one of the most interesting introductions that lead nowhere, but that <laughs> drop a um, an apocryphal case, an un, an unknown case, an unrecorded case, right into the lap of the of the mystified reader. Who, when it when it happens, is thinking, "Boy, oh boy, I'd like to know more about that." And then the case that follows has, you know, none of the same, at least in my view, none of the same interest or or, or curiosity or opportunity that that it has. Watson, you know, Watson begins by saying, "Boy, you know, there's a lot of things I could draw on in telling the the cases of Sherlock Holmes for for all the years he was in." Active practice, and so Watson begins by giving us a fact, a detailed fact. You know, Holmes was in active practice for twenty-three years. One of Watson's rare, you know, generally accurate facts, and then says, uh, you know, people are trying to destroy his his notes, and the source of this is known. And he says, if if this continues, basically, Mr. Holmes has given me his authority so that I could tell the entire story about the politician, the lighthouse, and the train cormorant. You know, so so beware. Well, boy, oh boy, I want to know about the politician, the lighthouse, and the train cormorant. But then in the next paragraph, Watson just sort of deflates all the limited reader interest he's built up. <laughs> he says, you know, the most terrible human tragedies were often involved in those cases which brought Sherlock Holmes the fewest personal opportunities. So, great human tragedies in cases which brought home uh, the fewest personal opportunities to show what he can do. And it is one of these that I now desire to record. <laughs> And so, and so he basically uh, tells us, um, you know, a case in which Holmes really doesn't do very much at all, but the whole action sort of revolves around this rather bizarre incident. Yeah, and what what's interesting here is the way the case comes to Holmes. It is via Mrs. Marillow. <laughs> who uh, was a landlady. And I, I, this is similar to the Red Circle when we see um, Mrs. Um, Warren come to Holmes and say, there's something funny going on upstairs. Mm. And Mrs. Marillow uh, was, was the same kind of thing. She, um, she said she has Mrs. Ronder uh, living with her. Um, and she's anxious to see you, that you might bring the whole parish at your heels which was uh, an interesting way of putting it. Not that uh, Holmes was uh, clergy-minded, but uh, Mrs. Marillow had uh, cautioned or, or had suggested to Mrs. Ronder that she might approach the clergy or the police. And she said uh, she really wants neither one, but she did name Sherlock Holmes as uh, someone who could be her... Um, uh, you know, her her confidant in this because she knew of his discretion and you know the way he handles these kinds of things. Well, so. well, you know this is this is just seems to me to be a complete knot. I just talk about a tangled skein. This whole thing's to 
seems to be a complete nod. First of all, this case is in 1896. Now, I know we should be talking about the personal tragedy, and we will, of, of poor Mrs. Ronder, the, the veiled lodger. But um, think about everything that's going on here. It's 1896. Watson is not with Holmes. He gets a hurried note from Holmes asking for his attendance. <laughs> so Holmes, you know... Um, has been talking to a client about which more I'll say in a moment and hurries off, dashes a note. So the client comes and talks to Holmes and Holmes says, my God, I really need Watson here. So he dashes off a note and he gets there. He finds out the good news that Mrs. Merillo doesn't object to tobacco because the room is dense with tobacco smoke (laughs) and it's not clear that she's smoking. So Holmes is clearly smoking up a chimney and, and she she, we will find out, is a very, very large person yes. um, whom, whom Watson calls an elderly, motherly woman of the buxom landlady type. <laughs> well, without casting any aspersions on Mary Gordon, who played Mrs. Hudson in the Universal films, <laughs> this is sort of an opera. Here is Holmes sitting with an elderly, even even rounder woman than, than, than Mary Gordon, who is a great actor. Um The room is dense with tobacco smoke, so she's apparently been sitting there placidly watching smoking. They've been sort of waiting for Watson. He's now there. And and Holmes says, your presence may be useful. Mrs. Merrillow has an interesting story to tell. Now, Mrs. Merrillow is the sort of woman that Holmes would have dismissed out hand. Here's a landlady who shows up, you know, with some story about a lodger. Oh, my goodness. You know, what's next in my practice? I'm going to be locating missing lead pencils next. (laughs) But no, no, she's been sitting there for a while. He's been smoking away. And why do we need Watson? Well, basically... You will understand, Mrs. Merrillow, says Holmes, that if I come to Mrs. Ronder, I should prefer to have a witness. Well, now why? (laughs) Why exactly, of all the cases that Sherlock Holmes has been involved in, is... It, does he suddenly feel, and by the way, a, a male doctor, I mean, if he really wanted a witness, you know, it, so, I don't well, know. Well, what's wrong with Mrs. Merlow as a witness, right? Well, I mean, y- y- yeah, yeah, well, very good what, point. What's wrong with, yeah, she's the live-in witness. Right. Not only is she a witness, she is a key. <laughs> but Holmes is, Holmes is clearly in a mood here, because as Watson bursts in and sees the acrid, smoke-filled environment, uh, and Holmes says he, she doesn't object to tobacco. If you wish to indulge your filthy, filthy habits, habits. Yes. <laughs> which, is, which is sarcastic, ironic Holmes. Yes. Um, so he, he, he was already in a, you know, a, a humorous mood. But recall. Well, well uh, maybe he may, he could have been pointing to a small area near the ceiling where there was still some clear air. <laughs> there, there you go. Uh, yeah, just float up there, Watson. Uh, but. I think what piqued Holmes's interest was the name of the lodger. It wasn't just a, a an anonymous lodger that Mrs. Merlot mm. was talking about. It was very specific. It was Mrs. Ronder, mm. and and Holmes uh, uh, Watson says, "Could you give me the points?" And he said, "That's very easily done. It will probably come back to your memory as I talk." Ronder, of course, was a household word. Mm. He was the rival of Wombwell. And this, of course, is George Wombwell, a proprietor of uh, a, a traveling circus in uh, the early 19th century in England. And, um, you know, kind of the P.T. Barnum of his, uh, of his age. Hmm. Uh, and, and Holmes says, uh, a, a rival of Wombwell and of Sanger, one of the greatest showmen of his day. So another P.T. Barnum type. But uh, Holmes said he had, um, he had looked into it. You know, the case worried me at the time, Watson. Here are my marginal notes to prove it. I confess I could make nothing of it. And yet the tragedy, and yet I was convinced that the coroner was wrong. Have you no collection of the Avis Parva tragedy? Mm. So this is something that had already been on Holmes's mind. That he wasn't able to solve. And here is an opportunity to hear from one of the major players in the tragedy. So, 
a little cold partridge, a little Montrachet, and Holmes and Watson are off to <laughs> Brixton to uh, get the story directly from Mrs. Ronder. Mm. But uh, why don't we pause here and then we can review what happened <clears throat> at Abbas, Abbas Parva and talk about other comparative tragedies in the canon right after this quick word. In 2023, the BSI Press has added more titles to its roster that you won't want to miss. First up this year is the latest in the BSI Manuscript series, a title that takes you, well, maybe a moment to connect to the story, The Haven Horror. If you guessed The Adventure of the Retired Colorman, you're more clever than Josiah Amberley. This manuscript, once owned by Dame Jean Conan Doyle, and bequeathed to the British Museum is a very clean one, coming as it did at the conclusion of the canon. But the essays that accompany it are wonderfully informative. Dan Andriaco looks at prostheses in the canon. The BSI's resident toxicologist Marina Stajic brings us into the realm of poisons. And our own Bert Wolder tells about the life of the artist Frank Wiles. These and more are colorful just as colorful as the original story that acted as a metaphor and reality, and it treats the reader to a kaleidoscope of shades and hues that will provide hours of reading pleasure. Be sure to get your copy of The Haven Horror before it's sold out at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. Okay, we're back and um, talking about terrible human tragedies. So, uh, thumbnail sketch. Uh, Mrs. Ronder had a heck of a husband, uh, <laughs> Mr. Ronder, uh, described as porcine uh, in his appearance, hog-like, boar-like, uh, just a, a, a disgusting human being. And he pretty much had a personality to match his appearance. And at the same time, Leonardo was the strong man, and he was obviously much more attractive, and Mrs. Ronder uh, fell in with him, and ultimately it turned to love, and the two of them plotted to do away with Ronder. Um, and Leonardo crafted a, uh, a club, a leaded club with nails coming out of it to mimic a lion's paw. And um, went into the cage that night with Ronder as he was feeding Sahara King. Smashed him in the back of the skull. And the lion turned on Mrs. Ronder and Leonardo fled. And she mm. called him a coward and ultimately ended up with a disfigured face. Uh, and this was seven years prior to when she's telling Holmes her tale. So she... Uh, lost her uh, the love of her life. She lost half of her face. She lost her ability to make a living and is finishing out her days in Mrs. Marillo's uh, abode. And, and by the way, Mrs. Marillo said that she was wasting away. Mm. <laughs> uh, and when she came to Mr. Holmes, she said, uh, yeah, her health, Mr. Holmes. She seems to be wasting away. Mm. A few pages later, when Holmes and Watson get to uh, the house, Watson said, um, long years of inaction had coarsened in the lines of her figure, but at some period she must have been beautiful. And it was still full and voluptuous. So, the buxom Mrs. Marlow <laughs> saying that the, the full and voluptuous Mrs. Ronder was wasting away. I, mm. I don't know what wasting away seems like to Mrs. Marlow, but... Uh, from a from a psychological standpoint, she certainly was wasting away. Mm. Well, it's another curious thing too that having gone to the trouble of obtaining a doctor as a witness, that the doctor, when visiting the tragically disfigured and wasting away, um, Mrs. Ronder apparently has no dietary advice or. Uh, <laughs> Con conducts no examination or makes no useful suggestion, perhaps, to allay her wasting away. Uh, perhaps he offered her a cigar. Since <laughs> <laughs> Filthy her, habit. Her landlady liked tobacco, apparently. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that's that, that's that's a very good summary. But you know, the um. um it's it's really not much of a case, you know. Holmes tells us that that uh, he had a visit from 
a member of the police force, a, a smart fellow, and who came and talked to him at the time, and there were one or two points, but he couldn't make anything of it. And, um, you know, basically, when we get to the case, I mean, the, the human tragedy here, obviously, is very real. Poor M Mrs. Ronder is not only horribly disfigured, but she's abandoned by uh, Leonardo, with whom she was passionately in love and who, according to her, remained in love. And in fact, the only reason that she's verbal now at this point, for some reason, seems to be that she's just read of Leonardo's death. Who, and, and his death was, was um, an accident. He died while bathing at Margate. Um, I don't know, you know? And... and uh, and, and why, after all this, all these years, and the death of Leonardo, you know, why now would, um, you know, poor Mrs. I mean, of course, there's no logic for it. But, well, but, um, I, I mean, perhaps uh, somewhere in her mind during these intervening seven years, she thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity for, uh, for a, a, a reunion with Leonardo. Maybe he'll come to his senses after all of this and say, I was so wrong, I was cowardly, I still want you. Mm. Uh, maybe she, she held out hope. And with his death, there was really no hope left for any kind of meaningful future for Eugenia Ronder. I mean, she, she had no prospects, she had no, no uh, love, she had no way of supporting herself, really, just uh, staying mm. in this room at Mrs. Marlowe's. Mm. But um, Holmes turns to her and um, he says, your life is not your own. Keep your hands off it. And mm -hmm. she says, well, what use is it to anyone? And Holmes replies, well, how can you tell? The example of patient suffering is in itself the most precious of all lessons to an impatient world. And the woman's answer was a terrible one. She raised her veil and stepped forward into the light. I wonder if you would bear it, she said. It was horrible. No words can describe the framework of a face when the face itself is gone. Two living and beautiful brown eyes looking sadly out from that grisly ruin did but make the view more awful. Holmes held up his hand in a gesture of pity and protest. And together, we left the room. Hmm. It, that's, I mean, it, without being more graphic, uh, I think Conan Doyle did a good job of expressing exactly what uh, she was struggling with there. Uh, but the good news is, I suppose, man, perhaps this isn't a tragedy after all. That two days later, uh, when I called upon my friend, he pointed with some pride to a small blue bottle upon his mantelpiece. There was a red poison label on it, uh, and it was prussic acid. She sent it to him by post. <laughs> Luckily, so, it didn't break in the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the postman's turned up dead on our doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, here's a woman at the end of this left with nothing. And, you know, in, in Redmond's delicate questions, he, he says, well, aren't... Most of Sherlock Holmes' cases tragic anyway. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I know there are some that are terribly sad um, and, and tragic in their nature as well. And the one I always go back to is um, the dancing men. You know, Elsie hmm. LC, LC Cubitt trying to escape from her sordid past, have found a kind and loving man in Hilton Cubitt and her past catches up with her in the form of Abe Slaney and he uh, shoots and kills Hilton Cubitt and uh, of course Elsie Cubitt was one of the subjects of our last episode as she was an attempted suicide hmm well to, to you know to the subject of suicide I, I do think that the one really redeeming feature of this case is that dialogue that 
that you read, you know, where Eugenia Ronder feels that the death of Leonardo has really snuffed out the last candle, the dim candle of potential hope for her. And she feels his loss from the world because she says, of course, as you said, the case is closed. And Holmes does say, you know, the, how can you tell, you know, keep your hands off it. Your life is not your own. The example of patient suffering. Um, I think that is that is a wonderful dialogue and a wonderful point. Um, particularly the, how can you tell, you know? Um, but to the cases of Sherlock Holmes, you know, that, in, that involve human tragedy, it's, it's, there is a long list, and I certainly agree with you about the dancing men. <laughs> you know, in, in the first cases he encounters, in, in the glorious Scott, you know, there's this awful murder connected to a robbery in addition to everything else. The Musgrave ritual, we have, you know, the asphyxiation of Brunton and, and the sad craziness of the housemaid. We have... Um, well, the speckled band, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You know, you've got blackmail, you've got Milverton, you've got uh, the golden pince We talked about that in terms of suicide. You've got the crooked man, you know, which is really a yeah, human, a that's, human tragedy. That's another one. Yeah, I mean, but 30 it, years wasted of, uh, you know, potential love gone. Yeah, but um, you could. But it's it's easier to make a list of the cases that don't involve human tragedy, right. because right. there's only a handful of them, really. Well, it's interesting because in in a number of the ones you mentioned, there is some sort of redemption through justice. So, in other words, Brunton, well, he was looking to make off with a family fortune, and he got what was coming to him. You know, I mean, if if you're a fan of any of the, uh, you know, Twilight Zone episodes or Alfred Hitchcock presents, <laughs> uh, written of course in the 50s and 60s, there was always some comeuppance for the villain at the end. They never got away with their crime, and uh, I mean, even in um, uh, the Crooked Man, Colonel Barkley. Uh, you know, was struck dead by an apoplectic shock. And then, of course, <laughs> made sure of his demise by banging his head on the fire grate. Um, you know, that that was karma for 30, uh, for, for a crime mm. of uh, 30 years uh, ago. So uh, I, I think it's these, these particular stories where there doesn't seem to be redemption at the end. That, you know, okay, Mrs. Ronder, uh, Patient suffering. Good luck with that. Let us know how it goes. You know, I, I suppose the lesson is for the readers, um, for for us to all learn from uh, her story. But I mean, yeah. uh, think about the very the very first story, Jefferson Hope, mm -hmm. how young Lucy was snatched away from him and uh, wasted away, and and uh, her marriage to Enoch Drebber. And how he chased uh, Drebber and Stangerson across the Atlantic to finally do them in. I mean, talk about heartache and tragedy. Hmm. Well, you know, they're, they're people who come to Sherlock Holmes, you know, generally, uh, you know, they're a lot. Let's put it this way. The, the, the most generous thing you could say about them in their big commonality is their lives have been disrupted, seriously disrupted in one way or another. And Holmes, you know, I mean, people would say this about Georges Simenon's uh, Sleuth Maigre, you know, that he was a mender of destinies, which he was and he wasn't. But, but Holmes, you know, will, to the best of his ability, you know, put people back on the right track. Um... Yeah, yeah, there usually is, as you say, a, you know, a comeuppance, a karma. Um, you know, Milverton gets his just desserts in the end. But still in all, you know, you take the devil's foot and, you know, the murder and insanity of, mm. of, of a family, yeah. uh, you know, hardly resolved by the fact that the, the miscreant dies, you know, by his own... Hoist by his own petard, as yeah. you can say. I mean, but there are cases, you know, scandal in Bohemia is not really a human tragedy. Case of identity, not really a human tra Redheaded League, not really a human oh, tragedy. More of a comedy. <laughs> yeah. Blue, car Blue Carbuncle, eh, not really a human tragedy. Mm -hmm. I mean, final problem, not 
not really a human tra- Mazarin stone not much really of a case yeah. but not not much of a tragedy yeah well uh, at least in this particular story and in many others Holmes got the resolution he was looking for in terms of uh, the solution to a case whether it was a recent case or a case long standing hmm true that's true and I suppose that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. How dare you? How dare you make a record of this case?